Welcome AP Bio students. This is your uh, ecology unit review uh, in preparation for your ecology test. Um, I thought I would put this together to uh, review a few things that we didn't have time to go over in class or I didn't have time to reinforce in class. Um, so just follow through this a little bit and I will walk you through a few of the ecology concepts that I know will appear on your test that's coming up here shortly. Um, most of these will also be fair game for the uh, AP exam. So to start off, let's talk about exponential growth curves. Um, an exponential growth curve, uh, you're only going to get exponential growth in population ecology uh, when you're looking at a situation where organisms have unlimited resources or access to unlimited resources. Um, and you need to understand that in reality, there's no such thing as unlimited resources. Eventually, uh, all ecosystems run out of something. Um, and at that point, whatever resource you run out of first, that is your limiting resource. So, for instance, if I'm growing a farm field and my farm field, the soil runs out of uh, usable nitrogen, then nitrogen is my limiting resource. And I can only grow corn plants up until the point where I run out of nitrogen. So if I run out of nitrogen right there, that limits my size. And when we hit that point, we call that carrying capacity. If a farmer wants to raise the carrying capacity in their, car in their corn field, what they're going to do is they're going to add nitrogen to the soil. We call that fertilizer. And he can raise his carrying capacity, and then uh, his corn plants will grow in up until this point. So that's kind of one of these uses of understanding uh, population growth and uh, exponential growth. Um, it's important to understand this concept of carrying capacity. It's also important to understand that carrying capacity is not fixed. Uh, carrying capacity can move. So this has implications for uh, natural ecosystems. It has implications for human population on the planet. Um, things like farming, agriculture, obviously that's important there. Um, but I would definitely know how population sizes grow. When population size levels off, um, we call that logistic growth. If we have an exponential curve followed by a, a, a leveling off around carrying capacity, we call that logistic growth. Um, make sure that you understand that what drives exponential growth is birth rates. Uh, life expect expectancy is not nearly as important because um, we talked about in class that, that living things have an opportunity to die once, but they can reproduce many times. Moving on. Uh, case selection and R selection. Um, R selection is uh, basically means that the organisms uh, are going to be more successful due to an increased reproduction rate. Whereas case selection, uh, you're working with um, uh, some selective advantage. So another way to think of that, um, organisms that depend heavily on R selection, you're going to be talking about something that usually has no parental care. They'll have huge litters of offspring, um, but there'll be very little parental involvement. So like bacteria don't do a, a lot of uh, nurturing and caring for their children, but they have a lot of them. Uh, whereas case selection... They have fewer offspring with lots of parental care. Um, a good example of that would be humans or elephants or a lot of the, the, the large multicellular creatures have, have case selection going on as their major selective force. I would definitely understand those two terms. Um, the, the AP Bio exam uh, loves to talk about our selection and case selection. Um, read about them in your book. Um, Surprisingly, they're not actually all that widely used anymore in real live ecology. Um, you can read about the controversy. Google search the, the controversy about case selection and R selection, and you'll find out that, uh, it, that they, they, they are definitely controversial. Some people don't really like the use of them, including myself. Moving on. Um, these are biomes. You need to know about biomes. Uh, I gave you a biome grid. Um, you definitely should fill those out. You should know biomes. If I give you characteristics of a biome, you should be able to tell me what biome they belong to. Um, also, going along with biomes, that all organisms in a biome fill some niche. Uh, a niche would be uh, the job of that organism in that particular ecosystem. Um, going along with niche is the idea of the competitive exclusion principle, which basically means if one organism fills a niche, does a job in a biome uh, more successfully than a similar organism, uh, uh, the other organism will be driven out. Uh, basically, one organism fills one niche at one time in a biome. Um, uh, it's, it's called the competitive exclusion principle. I would know about it. Make sure you know niches. 
Oh, trophic levels. Uh, basically, this all relates to food chains and food webs. Uh, at the bottom, bottom of all trophic levels, you will have the producers, which we typically think of as, as like terrestrial plants because we happen to be terrestrial creatures. But realistically, most of the producers are going to be phytoplankton. Um, they live in the ocean, the photic zone of the ocean, uh, that, that, that light penetrating region of the ocean. Uh, and then whatever eats those producers would be the first level consumers, the second level consumers, the top consumers. Um, that's what we would be looking at with trophic levels. Um, the amount of energy available drops as we go up in trophic levels. As we travel up a food chain, the amount of energy available goes down. And as a result, the number of organisms goes down as we travel up a food chain. And that one's obvious uh, because there's, there's fewer great white sharks than there are little teeny tiny fish in the ocean. That's, that's the way that works. Um, I would know that 10% rule. The 10% rule is kind of a rough rule that, that basically states that, that of the energy available to the producers, only about 10% of that energy makes it up into the first level consumers. And then of that energy available to the first level consumers, only about 10% of that energy makes it up to the second level consumers. So they're only getting 1% of the energy available to the producers down here. Um, read about the 10% rule. Make sure you understand the 10% rule. Uh, the other thing that, that this uh, trophic level situation does, it means that this top consumer up here at the top um, ends up eating a lot of these producers. Um, and what that means, you get this thing called uh, biological amplification of, of um, oh, if I introduce a, a toxin down here at the bottom, like uh, let's say I introduce mercury to the, the food chain down here near the bottom, near the producers or the first level consumers. The, it might not be in a high enough concentration to hurt the first level consumers, but since this top consumer is going to eat a lot of these and these are going to eat a lot of these, we end up with, um, uh, you, you kill off the bald eagles. Is basically what happens because the, the toxins get concentrated in their tissues because they're eating so many at the lower levels because only 10% of the energy from the preceding trophic levels available to them. Um, uh, biological magnification or, or amplification of, of toxins in the food chain. That's an important thing to understand. Um, this is how you might see a food web on the AP exam. They like to draw food webs like this. And all these arrows basically mean the, the, the drawing gets a little confusing, but it's really not that hard to understand if you understand what they're trying to draw. The arrows mean that this organism is making it into this organism. In other words, uh, in this example, A is being eaten by C, or C is consuming A. A went into C. Um, so that's what we're looking at here. And with a simple drawing like this, you should be able to identify some parts of this food web. Like, for example, letter A, since it's going into things, but it's not eating anything, uh, it's not possible to be a living thing that's not eating anything. So it must be eating sunlight and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So that means it must be a producer, uh, a phytoplankton or a plant. Um, that makes level B and level C, they must be first level consumers. Um, some other notable ones. We've got a top consumer up here because notice nothing is eating G. G is all by itself and lots of things are going into G. So G must be something that's, that's toothy and scary in our ecosystem because he's a top consumer. Um, a shark or a bald eagle from the, the trophic level pyramid that I just showed you. Um, if I were to do something like this, ooh, what if I added an arrow here? So now I've got A being eaten by B. So that means that B eats producers, so B would be an herbivore. But if B is also eating C, C can't be a plant because C is eating plants. So that means B is eating both, or wait a minute, B is being, oh, no, 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 it means that C is eating both plants and is also eating this, is eating a first level consumer, which must be some sort of, well, something that eats plants. So that would mean that C must be a, um, uh, an omnivore. It's eating both plants and other things, making it an omnivore. So C is now, uh, would be considered an omnivore. So I would ask you test questions like that, like who is an omnivore on this chart? And if it was set up like this, you'd be able to say, oh, look at C. He's eating a plant and he's eating a first level consumer. C must be the omnivore. Um, let's put a letter H on here just to add some confusion here because I might show you something like this on a test. So here's letter H all by himself. And right now he's not eating anything, so he's starving to death. But let's say he does that. Okay, well, H is now an herbivore, just like C and B were before I stuck this arrow in. Um, but how about I do this? Whoa, wait a minute. Now we got somebody that's eating plants and he's eating the top consumer. That's interesting. 
or this or this or this or this or this? What if everybody's eating H? What is up with H? Um, that makes H uh, uh, an organism that eats all the other organisms. Uh, and such a thing does exist. We call them decomposers. So I would be able to interpret a, a food web like this and, and, and make some predictions about what each one of these letters represents in a food web. Uh, nutrient cycling, I would make sure I knew about that. Water cycle, uh, carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle. Uh, basically, C-H-O-N-P-S. Those are the, the atoms, the types of atoms that we need to cycle in our biosphere because we just keep reusing the same atoms. We don't, uh, we don't use up atoms. We don't destroy atoms when we're done with it. Atoms that are currently a part of you will not always be a part of you. You will someday die and decompose. You produce waste throughout your lifetime that contain all these, these atoms. Uh, so we cycle these atoms through the biosphere. Uh, the ones I would particularly pay attention to definitely know the water cycle and the carbon cycle which we'll talk about periodically throughout the year. Um, the AP exam loves the nitrogen cycle. They will ask you questions about the nitrogen cycle. I will ask you about the nitrogen cycle on your ecology test. Um, the big deal with the nitrogen cycle is that all living organisms on the planet uh, are not capable of taking in atmospheric nitrogen. Um, 70, what is it, 72 percent, 78 percent? Whatever. Most of the atmosphere is made of nitrogen, uh, N2, two nitrogen atoms linked together in a covalent bond. Um, and that's, that's unavailable. It's, it's useless to you. Uh, so we have to convert N2 into NH3, ammonia, before it can be used by, by the other organisms in an ecosystem. And only nitrogen-fixing bacteria can do that. It's called nitrogen fixation. Uh, nitrogen fixation is the process of taking atmospheric nitrogen and making it into usable nitrogen that the rest of the biosphere can use. Um, I would read about nitrogen fixation. I would definitely know about it. It's a really important part of the nitrogen cycle, and the nitrogen cycle is the uh, the one um, uh, uh, cycle that that the AP exam does like to concentrate on. Uh, finally, uh, in ecology, we talk about human impact, and I know on, in class we we somewhat unfairly picked on Walmart quite a bit, but uh, we need to understand about human impact. Uh, on ecology, so that's why I threw up the Walmart parking lot here. Um, when we pave a, a chunk of something that apparently used to be forest, you can see the trees back there, um, that destroys habitat. Uh, destruction of habitat stresses out uh, many of the uh, uh, indigenous species. Uh, and, and stressed out species, really what happens, the, the, the main reason why, why humans drive so much extinction, it's not because we go out and deliberately, uh, uh, like, poach animals into extinction or, or hunt them into extinction. You build a Walmart parking lot, uh, those organisms are forced to move from their natural habitat. It stresses them out. They spend slightly less time worrying about procreation, making babies. Uh, and as soon as you do that, your birth rate drops. And what we looked at with the exponential growth curve is that as soon as your birth rate drops, your population drops. And it, when it drops to dangerously low levels, you drop uh, your, your biological diversity, uh, well, your biological diversity and your genetic diversity are going to go down, uh, and that makes for an unhealthy ecosystem, and you get ecosystem collapse. So that's really what ecologists spend a lot of time worrying about nowadays is um, where we build Walmart parking lots uh, and other things, obviously, uh, and how that affects uh, the rest of the ecology because we are part of the rest of the ecology, and we need to worry about how that's going to impact human health. So I hope this little review helped a little bit. Um, if you have questions before your test rolls around, uh, please use me as a resource. Ask me for help, uh, email, uh, or in class, or whatever. Um, I'll be more than happy to help you. Good luck.